Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that this message encourages you today. To find more information about our church or future events, go to tbfonline.net. So for just a moment, imagine with me. You, or maybe you and your spouse, or maybe you and some close friends. You've been hearing about this guy. Not really sure what to think about him. You've heard he's done some miracles, but all of a sudden, you show up along with them. And all of a sudden, this guy begins to talk. And when you start out, you're just there and you're listening. And as he talks, he's talking about his favorite subject. Y'all, y'all good now? Y'all good? Y'all good, good. And hey, they brought their Bible. They're good, I'm telling you, all right? And so all of a sudden, you're listening to this guy talk. And there's, you're one of 20,000 people. They call it the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, but there's 5,000 men. They just counted the men back in that day, so probably 20,000 plus. Most theologians will say it was the largest crowd that Jesus ever preached to. And all of a sudden, you're listening to this guy teach, and you've been there for a while. All of a sudden, the seconds turn into minutes, and minutes to hours, and finally, you realize, man, it's getting late in the day. The, the sun's going down. And as the sun's going down, your stomach begins to growl. And you're going, ah, man, I'm kind of hungry. And there's a group of people, you don't really know who they are, but there's 12 of them, and they're kind of rushing around trying to find something. You don't have any idea what they're trying to try to find. And all of a sudden, the miracle of multiplication happens. This one man takes five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, understand, it's not five loaves like you think of loaves. It's like five pieces of Melba toast and two sardines. And all of a sudden, you're, you're sitting there. And all you do is that you see this one man, and all of a sudden, he kind of takes the boy's Lunchables, you know, kind of raises it up and says something up to the skies. And all of a sudden, this group that kind of hanging around, they begin to pass out the bread, and you eat so much that you are full. So if you were there at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, because you watched him multiply and feed 20,000 plus, and because you were there, does it change you? Or do you leave the same way you showed up? You see, I know that I have been at this text, and when I preached it, I knew I was coming back to it. It must be a really important miracle, because I want you to see this, okay? Okay is that the feeding of the 20,000 plus is the only miracle that is in all of the four gospels, excluding the resurrection. There is so much truth you could do, a series of sermons. You could do a month long. But today we talk about this thing called stewardship and how God wants to multiply your money and what that looks like. And so when you think about that, it seems like the disciples are really concerned and, and they, they probably are concerned. I mean, they probably are concerned. And, and what, what, look what it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 34. It's a different gospel, but same story. It says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So, and I mean, Jesus had compassion on them. I think the disciples probably had some compassion on them with, and they cared because they knew they were hungry, and how are we going to feed this? And they kind of took ownership of it, but really, they didn't have any idea what to do. Then, then all of a sudden, that Jesus says Jesus had compassion on them. And, and I will say to you that no matter what you got in your life today, that you're really, you don't really sure, and you're, and, and you're really concerned because you're not sure that there's anybody that is concerned about you. And I will promise you, there is somebody that is concerned about you and about your well-being. 
It might not be right now in your life, but I promise you, there is another human that is physically concerned. And although they might be concerned, and although you might have 10 or 20 or 100 people that are concerned about you, I promise you before the name of Jesus today, nobody has concern about you like Jesus does. That's so bad. Y'all were so bad in that. I'm, you're the third, you're supposed to be the best service. You just acted like the middle service right there. You, I mean, that's the way they act. They don't amen. They just kind of sit there and look at you. Okay, let's try this again. No matter what, Jesus has compassion for you. Thank you. All right. So when you think about that, the disciples bring this news to Jesus that, hey, you know, he, he we, and, and, and no one read it so well. They don't know what to do. And then Jesus turns the responsibility back on them. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 13. It says, he replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go buy food for all this crowd. Hold on a minute, all right? These guys have already left everything. They ain't even got a job. I mean, they're broke. They ain't got nothing. And they're going, How, unless we go buy food. Bro, bro, you ain't got, who's we? You ain't got any money. You ain't gonna buy no, you're gonna buy nothing from nobody. And all of a sudden, I mean, you think about what is said right here is that here's what they forgot. They had forgotten all the miracles that Jesus had already done, and they forgot as disciples what you and I have a tendency to forget, that whatever we got going on in our life, that whatever Jesus and God calls you to do something, and when he calls you to my faith. Now, don't miss this. This is where most, everybody who's a Christ follower, students all the way up to senior adults, this is where we miss it. When God calls you to do something that is by faith, is that we just go, oh my gosh, we can't do that. We can't do that. Kind of like the disciples. They can't be fed. They forgot what we forgot that Jesus is standing right with you and whatever he's called you to, he will give you the power to accomplishment. Church, can I get an amen on that? Everything he's called us to, he will promise, he promises that his presence will be enough. And then when Jesus tells them to give away something, John, he tells him, he says, you give him something to eat. Well, John records it in the gospel. He records what Andrew says. So John chapter six, verse eight. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far would they go among so many? <laughs> and then Jesus looks at him and says, you give them something to eat, and then the next statement, and please don't miss this, because if you're not careful, you kind of you kind of read by this one. He says, everybody sit in groups of 50. Now, the reason that's so important, I haven't read this from any commentary, any theologian. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God just gave me this. I believe that when he said, have groups sit down in 50, I think Jesus was given a prophecy of what was to come called Pentecost. You see, all these people knew about their Jewish, their Jewish holidays, their Jewish feasts. And the first one was Passover, where they would sacrifice a lamb and, and the blood was spilt on an altar and they would cut the throat of the lamb and it would be a picture of Jesus coming, the perfect lamb of God, giving his life away so that you and I could live in freedom and not, not have to worry about death. Is that, that's why Jesus died for us, so that we could have freedom. But you see, once Pentecost, I mean, once the Passover came, 50 days later was the feast of Pentecost. And what that was, was that we talked a little bit about last week. And that was that they would take the first fruits of their wheat. They couldn't buy the first fruits. They couldn't sell the first fruits. They couldn't eat the first fruits. They would have to take the first fruit of their wheat and they would make two loaves of bread. And then they would take it and they would take it to a priest. The priest would take the bread, hold it up, and wave it before God. And it was an aroma, what you just sang about. It was an incense to God. Let incense arise. It was an aroma to God and that because they gave the first fruits. They knew what Pentecost was. Well, see, what they didn't understand was what was going to happen after Jesus would die and he was resurrected. And after he was resurrected, guess what happened 50 days later? Thing called 
Pentecost happened. And that's where the Spirit of God fell on a group of people and the Spirit of God came to indwell in a group of people, not like in the Old Testament where the Spirit of God would come and go for certain kind of events. But now the Spirit of God permanently, permanently lives in individuals. Is that you thought that the, that the miracle of multiplication was great? Oh no, there was gonna be a greater miracle that's gonna take place. And other than the resurrection, it was the greatest miracle to take place. It was when Pentecost happened, 50 days after the resurrection. So when Jesus says, sit them down in groups of 50, I think it was a picture of Pentecost coming. And nobody really understood it except for Jesus himself. And so when you think about what he was doing here, is that here Jesus is going to multiply the loaves. So I want to give you three thoughts of multiplication. Now, these have got to happen before the multiplication of your finances take place, all right? So here we go, okay? Here's the first principle. Number one is order before multiplication. Order before multiplication. You know what? Jesus could have taken the five loaves and two fish and thrown it up to heaven, and God blessed it, and the, and the loaves and the fish just landed in everybody's lap. He could have done that. So why did he tell to put everybody in groups of 50, other than the fact that probably I think it would have been a, a prophecy of Pentecost? Well, because he... He, order was a real important thing to Jesus. And the reason he had them sit down in groups of 50 was because he set them down because order was real important. You see, God doesn't bless things in our life that are not in order, especially our finances. God blesses things that are put in order. It's why Paul tells the church at Corinth about having order in worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. It says, but, but all things must be done appropriately and in an orderly manner. He's talking about in the worship service at the church of Corinth here. And so we think about this. Now, why is order so important? Well, let me, let me talk about why order is so important for our staff, the, the staff that I get to work with every day. First of all, I'll tell you the reason that order is so important is that everybody on my staff understands this, that in James, it talks about that we have more accountability because it says those who are in ministry, those who are in full-time Christian vocation, you know what it says about us? It says, they are under stricter judgment. That means we're under stricter judgment. So therefore, order has to be an important thing for us. That's the reason that when, we, when people say, you know what, I think that the, I want to make the Breach Fellowship my home, then we tell everybody, okay, it's an orderly thing. We ask you to go through growth track, and we ask you to go through growth track and be fully engaged in the church of the living God. If you want your child to be baptized. We love that. We celebrate that. But that cannot happen until they go through a new believer's class. Why? Because God is a God of order. It's why some, when somebody goes through Regen, is that Jim Johnson never lets them become a leader in Regen until they first go through Regen first because God is a God of order. So here's the question though. Are our finances in order? Now, I think you know this, but if we're spending more than we make, I can promise you your finances are not in order. See, what happens is, is that, is that and it, this just came out this past week, that right now we have reached an all-time all high for a country. We are, for the first time ever, we have exceeded $1 trillion in credit card debt. Now think about that. Why, why is that? Now, I know there's inflation, inflation is here. I get all that. But usually it's because we spend more than we make. Okay, okay, so let me just illustrate this way, all right? You've heard me say this, so it's not a surprise, all right? When it comes to a person, if Phil or Shara, who, my wife Shara, who's the person who loves clothes the more, the most? Well, that's me. She calls me a clothes horse, all right? I have more clothes than she does. I own that. I'm good with that. I'm not insecure about that. That's why I'm preaching about that, all right? So just know that, all right? So the thing is, is that, you know what? If you or me or somebody were to go into anywhere and buy anything and there was a tag, no matter what you're buying, clothes, other kind of merchandise, whatever it is, and they would say on the tag, this product is 20% more than the sticker price. Nobody's going to buy that. Are you kidding me? You're almost ready to cuss the salesman at the store. What the heck is this? We do it all the time. We just give our credit card. This is, okay, I know when preachers tell stories, sometimes people look and go, bro, come on. Is that a real story? Because I know people go, that's not a real story. This is a true story. It happened to me, all right? I was on a church staff. I was telling a staff member that was over me. I was telling him that, you know, that Sharon and I were kind of struggling. Christmas was coming and we just didn't feel like we had enough money for really for Christmas. We'd put money back, just didn't feel like we had enough. And 
and I had taken a pretty major cut in salary to go to that church. And, and uh, he, he looked at me, and this guy's over me. He said, well, just do what we do. And I said, well, what do y'all do? He said, November 1st, David Dowdy, you're going to love this story. He said, you know what? He says, just do what we do. November 1st comes. We just, we just buy everything we want to for our kids. We put it all on our credit card, and we don't really, we're not really concerned about how much money we're spending. We just get whatever we want to, and then we spend the entire year paying that off until we get to next Christmas. You mean you did all that to celebrate Jesus' birth? You got to be kidding me. And I came home, and I told my wife that, and she went, no, I don't think we're going to do that. That's not good. That's just not good, all right? We well, see, and that's kind of the way that we use credit card. And so here's what I, we want to do, okay? Because let's be honest. If you're going to get your finances in order for some people here, then you're going to have to have a plan. You're going to have to spend less than you make. So I need everybody right now, everybody here, I need you to get your phone out. Everybody get your phone out, okay? And some of you are just, just looking at me. See, nobody listens to the pastor. Get out your phone. Maggots, get your phone out. Thank you. So your wife ain't listening. She ain't pulled her phone out either, right? Anyway, so I... So anyway, all right, now, we want to help in this. So here's what I want to do, okay? Now, we're gonna, they're going to put a, a QR code. We need you to scan that. Now, before you, now, let me tell you what you're scanning, okay? That is Right Now Media. That's a new resource that we have in our church. We have paid for all that. It is great for personal Bible studies. It's great for your life group. It's great for... Uh, for, for parenting, uh, for counsel for parents. It is just a great wealth of knowledge of incredible teaching, all right? So you scan that. And now when you go in, you're gonna have to set up an account, but it's free, okay? So make sure you do that, okay? Uh, Mr. Magger, would you be sure to help your wife give that to her, okay? So anyway, all right? So anyway, the thing is, is that we want to help in that. But let me tell you, even though that if you have a plan that you're gonna be on a budget, Please, please, please have some accountability with your budget. You cannot spend more than you make, all right? So have some accountability for the budget. So the first principle is, is order before multiplication. Here is the second thing I want to give you. Second thought is bless before multiplication. So yes, you have to have order before, you have to have order before multiplication. That means get on a budget, spend less than you make, but also... The only way that your finances are going to be blessed, it first of all, just like the disciples when they, they took the, the bread and the fish, and then what did they do? They brought it to Jesus. You've got to be able to take your first 10% and you've got to bring it to Jesus. If you don't do that, if you don't do that first, your finances will never ever be blessed. It's what got the nation of Israel in so much trouble. I mean, for years and years and years, you know what they didn't do? They didn't honor God with their finances. And finally, the last book of the Bible before there's 400 years of silence, okay? They have not honored God. So Malachi, through the prophet of Malachi, this is what he says to the people, okay? So Malachi chapter three, verse six. He says, first of all, I, the Lord, do not change. Let's stop right there, okay? At this point, God is making a statement about his own character. And this is what he's saying. I don't change. I don't change about the things that, I, that are written down that I give permission to written down, all right? So, so you know what? We don't struggle with God saying, you know what? Thou shalt not commit murder. That's an Old Testament principle. There is not one parent here that would look at your kid and go, you know what? I got a great idea. For free time today, why don't you go out and rob a store and see if you can get caught or not? Just see if you can get away with it. What? You, no, you don't rob, all right? It says, okay, you, you make sure, okay, thou shalt not steal, Okay, we wouldn't tell a kid to steal, so we, we're okay with that. We're okay with, with that principle, okay? Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witnesses, all right? Then is one, another one, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, in America, especially even in the church, we've gone crazy with that one, is that we just disregard that one completely. So you tell me what, any, any person you date, just have sex with them, it's all right. I mean, even if you're not married to them, live with each other, try it out, make sure. And, and ladies, if he ever looks at you and goes, hey, we need to live together. Why do we need to live together? Well, because you know what? You wouldn't walk into a store and try on a shoe without first buying it. And that's when you respond, well, let me tell you, okay, I'm not a shoe, okay? So just know that, all right? So see, we, we, we might struggle with that, but that's God's principle. Can I tell you another principle he has in the Old Testament? It's about tithing, he has not changed about it. I, the Lord, do not change. So his principles in the Old Testament, it can still be lived out. Sure, the tithing thing started in the Old Testament. It's all the way through Scripture. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. And then it says, so this. So 
He said, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. So you know why? You know the reason that they're not destroyed? Okay, let's read on here, okay? He says in verse 7, ever since the time of your ancestors. In other words, this ain't the first group that hadn't been doing this tithing thing. No, you had ancestors way before you that ever quit tithing. They didn't teach you, so now it's not important to you. So therefore, he said, Ever since the time of ancestors, you have not turned away. From, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. All right. The only reason that God hasn't destroyed them was because He made a covenant with them that He wouldn't destroy them. But look what it says. He says, "Return to me, and I'll return to you," says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, "How are we to return?" Pretty good question, right? Will a mere Will a mere mortal rob God? Let's stop right there. So, let me ask a question: With your money. Are you tithing to the Lord? Here's a better question. Are you robbing God? You, like I said, you would never look at your kid and say, go rob a store. But yet we give, especially as adults, we give ourselves permission to rob God. Oh, no, don't worry. It's going to get better here in a minute, all right? So here you go, all right? So, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Verse 9, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And then verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, what's the storehouse? The storehouse was a room that was set outside of the temple that they would, they would bring all their first fruits to, and they would use that to minister to everybody around them. He said, bring the tithe in the storehouse. So the tithe in the storehouse in the Old Testament, it was around the temple. The storehouse in the New Testament is called the church. Well, why would you say that? Well, several reasons. Number one, it was God's idea to start the church. Nobody else had that idea but God. God started the church. Also, Jesus died for the church. And also, the church is the only organization that God called to change the world. And guess what? The church is the only organization that will last forever. Every relationship you got in your life has a shelf life. Even your marriage, it all has a shelf life. Because when you get to heaven, you're not going to be married as you're married now because you're married to the Lamb of God, to Jesus himself. And so you have to understand that when we talk about that it's the only organization that will last forever. But what do we do? We give our excuse, we give ourselves excuse not to tithe. And so what we do is that we just rob God. We just take money we're supposed to give to God to him. We don't, we don't, what we're supposed to give to him, we don't give to him. And he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Okay, the only time in all of scripture that God says, test me. It refers to your tithe. Test me in this. You don't believe I'll do it? Test me. And then it says, test me. And then God puts his integrity at stake in the word. And this is what he says. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will, be not, there will not be room enough to store it. I mean, when you think about this, folks, there should never be a time in your life that you are not giving your 10% to a local church. If our church is not your church and you're not supposed to be here, go somewhere where you can get plugged in and you can give that church your 10%. You take your hands off of it. Matter of fact, you know what the scripture says about the tithe? It, it, it really is not giving your tithe, okay? When, when I say that, you really you don't even give your tithe. You return your tithe because the book of Leviticus says the tithe is the Lord's. So you're just returning to him what is already his. Now, it is by faith because you got to trust with him by faith. You know, and there's a lot of people that always ask, they go, well, do, when you tithe, do you tithe off the net or the gross? And you've heard me say this, and that completely depends on you. Do you, want to be, do you want to be netly blessed or grossly blessed? That's what it depends on. So you gotta decide what you're gonna do there. And so when you think about giving your whole, your, your tenth, you see, the tenth is set apart. That's what it says in Leviticus. It's set apart. It's holy. The 10% you don't touch, you give it to the Lord through the local church that God's called you to. And then he says, test me in this. It's the reason that um, we do a money-back guarantee at our church. If you've never tithed, we tell you to give off the gross for six months. If you're not completely satisfied with what God does with your money, this is backed by our leadership team. We'll give you all the money back. Why would we do that? 
Because God says, test me. If God can put his integrity at stake, we can put our integrity at stake. That ain't a big deal. Test me in this. And see if I won't throw open the windows of heaven. When I was in seminary, I, I worked with a guy that was just, boy, a godly man, a great businessman, laid carpet and tile. And so that's what I did for my part-time job while I was a seminary student. And the one thing that Mr. Gene always talked about was tithing. I mean, that was kind of his deal. He talked about tithing over and over and all, all the time. And I, finally, I looked at him one day and I said, Mr. Gene, why do you always talk about tithing? He said, well, because we need to not trust ourselves. We need to trust God with our money. I said, well, why is tithing such a big concept to you? He said, well, it's real simple. He said, you see, I got a shovel and I take my shovel and I throw it up to God. And all of a sudden, what God does, he takes his shovel and throws it back down on me. And this is what I've always seen, that no matter what I throw up to God, he always throws down more on me. And it's real easy to go, well, you know what, I've tried that deal. And I mean, you know, uh, God just has never blessed me. Really? <laughs> the fact that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, that you did nothing to get, that Jesus sacrificed for you to have, and the Holy Spirit of God lives in you to give you pur purpose and direction and counsel, and also the fact that you are not going to spend eternity and you're going to escape the damnation of a place called hell, that wouldn't be enough for you? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. This morning when I walked in, I got up earlier much earlier than Cheryl does on Sunday. And I walked into my bedroom and I saw her laying there and God says, you don't think you're blessed? You're a blessed man. And I don't need any amens about that because I know you're thinking, okay, I'm more blessed than she is, all right? I don't need any amens about that, all right? So the thing is, is that I'm sitting there going, and God, God, God woke me up this morning. Would that not be enough to tithe off of? That you, that you rob God of, of what is his? So, how in the world, what, what is this tithing all about? You see, the results of tithing is always about ministering to someone else. It's why we're able to send $20,000 to resurface a basketball court for a school in Kenya and to partner with the Gale family who are international partners. It's why we're able to pay people's mortgages, to pay people's medical bills, to give, to give gift cards for groceries, it's why we're able to have a next-gen camp. It's why we're able to have interns for the summer. It's why we are able to have a, a daddy-daughter dance night. It's why we're able to have a mother-son date night, a marriage conference, and a women's, a women's night, a men's night. Why do we do all that? Be simply, how in, the world, how in the world are we able to purchase the acreage right across the street for us at Powell Grove. How in the world would we do that? Simply for one reason. Because you bring your tithe into the storehouse, that's why. That's the only reason we do any of that. It's because of the faithfulness of you and what you give. And so when you think about that, you see, there's a lot of people that just go, you know what? Uh, I, I'm just not really sure about this. Well, let, me, let me just give a quick word of warning with you about some things here, Okay. The first word of warning I would say is that to every person here who has a job, you got a job, you ought to be giving your 10%. You take your hands off of it, that's God's, you don't touch it, you give it to God first. You take your hands off of it. So that's the first thing you do. And so you see what happens is, is that men, if I could just speak directly to you. You see, men, what we do is that we're never really in a habit of taking counsel from anybody. It's the reason we don't take counsel from our wives. If you're a single man, you still don't take counsel from people because we have this kind of innate thing about us that's in us that we, we don't need counsel. So, so we don't take counsel from anybody. So we sure don't take counsel from God, especially with our finances, because that is such a sacred cow to us. So let me be an equal opportunist here, Okay. Ladies, you got a job, you're supposed to tithe your 10%. Your 10% is not supposed to go to Amazon. It ain't supposed to go to, to buy bags and purses. It's not to buy to, uh, for your tuition for your kids. It's not to spend on your kids. It's not to spend on your grandkids. It's not for your pedicures and your manicures. And I'm telling you, ladies, if you go and get your toes done and you spend your tithe money and you get a toe fungus of it, you have been warned, all right? Don't come to me and say, hey, pray for me. I got a toe fungus. What, did you tithe? No, I didn't tithe. Well, that's what you did, all right? And men, you know what we do with our tithe? A lot of you men, you're driving your tithes. You're in so much debt with that crazy car because you, you had to have it. 
Had to have it. Therefore, but we're going to rob God. We're going to not give God what it says. And see, nothing happens, if I could give a word of warning, is that a lot of times we say, well, I'll tithe if I know that God will bless me financially, and God very well might do that. But you know where your blessings are? Eternity. It's where you spend all of eternity. That's where your blessings are. And let me tell you, if you didn't know this, Every person who has never given, who's never bowed a knee to Jesus, never given their life to Jesus, they will stand before God at the great white throne judgment, where they will be sentenced to a place called hell for all eternity. But every believer in Jesus, we will all stand at the judgment seat of Christ, where our works will be judged, including what we did with our money. So you better ask yourself, how are you going to stand? Now, before I give you the third thought here. Let me just say, because a lot of people usually ask, okay, if I haven't been tithing for a while or never tithed, do I need to catch up from the past? No, you don't. I don't see see that anywhere in scripture. Just start right now with what you got and start tithing. Now, a lot of people say, well, we're in so much debt, we can't tithe. Well, get some accountability, get on a budget, and who knows, you, you might be able to tithe and don't even know it. Because the wasteful spending you got. But let me tell you, you, you might have to make some changes. But also I would say to you that if you say, you know, I just, we just, there's no way. Because I understand where reality meets and I, I, I get all that. Well, then make it your goal to say, okay, we're going to start. We're going to start giving this, but we're going to get to 10%. And, and start working to get out of debt. So I would tell you that before we get to the third one, there might be some changes that you have to make. But here's a third principle. This is the one I close with, all right? It's given away before multiplication. You see, the miracle doesn't happen in Jesus' hand. Oh, yeah, the disciples had to first of all come and bring it. Just like you have to first bring, bring it, to bring your money to the Lord through the local church. Yes, you have to do that. But what happens is, is that it didn't even happen in the disciples' hand. So, can you imagine? Jesus is there, and you're there, and you're watching this happen. And you have no idea what Jesus is doing when he takes this boy's lunch, his, this lunchable. I mean, a lunchable with <laughs> two pieces of two pieces of, of two, two sardines and five pieces of Melvin toast. What a bad lunchable, right? I mean, who? What kid would walk home and go, oh, thanks for the Lunchable, Mom. It was great. I had two sardines and five pieces of Melba toast. What a great day this has been. And all of a sudden, Jesus takes the boy's lunchbox, takes it out, just holds it up, blesses it. And I can see the disciples just, and you're watching this happen. You're one of 20,000. You're watching it happen. And I see the disciples in a circle around Jesus. And Jesus takes a piece of Melba toast, just a small portion, tiny, just a little bit of fish. Breaks it off. I think he started with Peter first because Peter would be the the planter of the first New Testament church. And he just puts it in Peter's hand. Just takes and just puts it, I mean, hardly anything in his hand. And Jesus looks at him and goes, go, give it away. Jesus, would you like to bless that again? No, I'm good. Go ahead and go, go, give it away. And all of a sudden, he gives all of it out to the 12 and says, go give it away. And all of a sudden, they start giving it out. And every time they give it out, there's more that shows up in their hand and just keeps multiplying. Every person just keeps multiplying. And they just keep giving it to him little by little, just giving it away. Because, see, the miracle didn't happen when Jesus blessed it. The miracle didn't happen when he gave it to the disciples. The miracle only took place when they gave it away. The miracle of your finances is not multiplied until you give it away. That's never going to happen until you choose to give it away. Why would, and, and you know, and, and, and it says, it's kind of just of a tagline that Nolan talked about that when he read it, that, oh, I love this part. It's kind of a tagline. Oh, by the way. There's 12 basketfuls left over. Why did the disciples get the basketfuls? Why did the 20,000 not get doggy bags? He could have done that. Why did he do that? 
Why do you get the disciples? Don't miss this. This is why I gave it to the disciples. If you read in the book of Luke, there's three miracles that are done in this area called Bethsaida. One, there was a man that was born blind that Jesus healed him. Number two, when Jesus walked on water. And number three, the feeding of the 5,000. And if you keep reading in Luke, you know what Jesus says about Bethsaida? It says, woe to you, Bethsaida. Bethsaida would experience judgment for all of eternity because they were present, they saw it happen, and they walked away and they were never changed because they saw the multiplication. They just walked away from it. So the question for you is, are you changed because you were there? Because of what Jesus done for you? Would you allow him to multiply your, your finances? That you would just give it away? Why would he give the disciples? Because the disciples would be the ones, would be the founders of the New Testament church. And they would start the church in the New Testament. They were there at Pentecost. And they started with that group of people. And guess what happened? Is that they understood that this whole thing about generosity is that that's what the multiplication is about. It's not just about the tithe. It's about being generous as well. Those disciples, their cry of their heart was exactly what King David said. In Psalm 69, he says, I have zeal for the house of God. Those disciples, when they started the New Testament church, just like when the Bridge Fellowship started, a building, okay? The temple was, the, the temple is no more. He doesn't need the temple. You see, the church, the Bridge Fellowship is not a building. It's a group of people, just like in the New Testament church. They didn't need the temple. They still went to the temple. They didn't need it. Why? Because the temple resided in them. And so therefore, he says, you go and you make disciples. You do what you're supposed to. You see, this group of disciples, what happened with them, that they had the zeal for the house of the Lord consumed them. December the 3rd, we're having an offering that we're taking. And it is to put us in position to give us leverage on what we're going to be doing is what we're going to be, what we're going to be building. I shared this with a small group of people, and I wish I would have never shared it. But once I shared it, I shared it with a few, a few of our staff members. They wouldn't let me renege on it because I wanted to move. I wanted to go back. They said, no, don't, no, don't. But the amount that we're asking for this one-time offering, now remember, this is not your tithes. This is over and above your tithes. This is offering. This is over and above your tithes. We're asking God for a million dollars on that day. That's going to take a lot of faith. And let me just tell you, you see, I've told you this. I don't need any more space. I've got enough space to preach. I don't need more space. But if you want to come along with us and join the vision to say, no, we're about reaching people that are not yet here. That's what we're about. Then we would ask you to have zeal for the house of God. Watch the video with me, if you would. I want to close with this story about generosity. I told it years ago. It's the best story about generosity that I've ever seen. I'm a seminary student at Fort Worth, in Fort Worth at Southwestern Seminary. I'm rooming with a guy by the name of Jim Presnell. On a Sunday night, Jim and I go to Glenview Baptist Church. First time we'd ever been to that church. It eventually would be, become my home church. But the pastor, Dennis Ball, gets up and he taking the offering. He said, we're asking you to be a hilarious giver. It says in scripture to be a cheerful giver. That word cheerful is translated hilarious. You know what that means? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. But we're just trusting God. He said, we want you to be a hilarious giver. Jim Preston 
pulls out his checkbook, his back pocket. Now, I know some of you are so young, you have no idea what I'm talking about with a checkbook, all right? There was a registry that you kept your, never mind, all right? You just don't worry about it, all right? But Jim looked at it, and he said, I got $326 in my checking account. How much you got? He said, I got just about that much. Why? Let's be hilarious in our giving. I said, what are you talking about? Let's write the full amount and just give it to this church. I said, dude, this is not our home church. I know, but just think, if, we just are, if we're just hilarious in our giving, let's do this and see what God will do. I looked at him, I said, you're crazy. I'm not doing that. Oh, man, come on, no. You got a pen? I said, yeah. Let me see it. Give it to him. He writes out a check, paid to the order of Glenview Baptist Church, $326. I said, dude, you understand that rent for our apartment is due on Thursday. $300 a piece. Yeah, I know. What are you going to do? I don't know. But I'm going to be a hilarious giver, and God's going to come through. I said, you, you've lost your mind. Monday happened. Nothing took place. Monday night, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to start fasting tomorrow. I'm going to fast everything but water. He fasted all day on Tuesday, nothing but water. I said, are you hungry? He said, yeah, I'm hungry. What are you going to do tomorrow? We'll keep fasting. Fasted, to, fasted Wednesday. Only water, nothing to eat. Nothing happened. Thursday morning, heard anything? No, it's all good. Thursday afternoon, we're at Cinnamon Tree Apartments. The phone rings, I pick it up, hello? Yeah, this is Southwestern Seminary Business Office. Is Jim Preston on there? He is. I just hear Jim side of the conversation. Yeah, it's Jim Preston. Yeah, I can do that. Thanks, goodbye. I said, what's going on? He goes, I don't know. I said, the business office wants to see me. I said, did you not pay a parking ticket or something? I think I'm good. I don't know what it is. So we go. We get to the office. The lady says, are you Jim Preston? You got identification? He goes, I do. Hands me an envelope. He opens the envelope up. It's a check made out to Jim Preston for $1,000. He asked the lady, he said, who brought this in? Nobody. It was, it was mailed in. And I said, who's it from? He goes, I, I, don't, I don't know him. I have no idea who it, I have no idea who this is. You don't know? No. I said, dude, what are you going to do with $1,000? First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to give the Lord what is the Lord's, the first 10% of it. And then me and you, we're going to go to Poncho's and we're going to eat. And if you ain't never lived in Texas, for a seminary student, Poncho's was the place, dude. I'm telling you, it was $4.99 for all you could eat. And at the table, they'd have, they have Mexican flags. You'd raise that Mexican flag, and they'd walk up and go, yes, and you'd tell them what you wanted. I'm going to tell you, five loaves and two fish had nothing on us when we showed up at Poncho's. And we ate till we couldn't eat anymore. And oh my goodness, when you didn't think you'd eat anymore, they brought you this basket of sopapillas. You'd tear off the corner. You'd pour honey in them. And you'd eat those things. And you just thought, God, this is so good. We just sit and laugh. I missed the blessing of watching God come through because I wouldn't trust God. This offering, yes, we're asking you to have zeal for the house of God. I told you what the goal is. I'm not asking you to give. I'm just asking you to pray. God tells you don't give anything. That's when you and the Lord, not me. If you want to come along with the vision, I just ask you to pray. But let me tell you, I'm going to ask you, also ask you to trust God.